five of the 1995 series. And I wouldn't trade any of it. I, I love my life. I do. I. Uh... parties where there's a good chance somebody's coming out of their clothes. No, we hope you enjoy <laughs> hope you enjoyed that little introduction. Sorry about that Lampion joke in there. Anyway, we did uh, on the previous video did all the work on the tail up to this point and we want to get busy doing the glassing, you know, putting the horn in, the hinges, the tips, and get this puppy ready, man. Building season is here. Joe Adamusco's doing here tomorrow. We really want to get some work done. Right, I've gotten the tape off of this and we want to pick this up. The first thing I want to do today is I want to glass the middle of this. And the first thing is we've taken the tape off and make sure we don't have any ridge here. Now, the two things that you can have a problem with here is if you have a step and you sand it thin, the, the sheeting gets paper thin. Well, you don't want that either. The leading edge can have a little notch and I see this does have its out by uh, 20 thousandths or something. But I'll take some 220 and just get this perfectly smooth but smooth without thinning the sheeting any more than you have to. Just enough, and I would say this is going to be plenty, just enough 
so that you have a perfect smooth transition. You don't have a step in there anywhere. Now, some of the neat things that have happened in the last uh, day or so, geez, Richard Neal, my friend Richard Neal from New Mexico, has sent me some really great tapes, Warbird tapes. There's some air show stuff on there. What happens is people, they enjoy the videos and they contribute back into the videos. So I can then, at some point in time, like this Buddy Marcellus music, the Rick Ashford uh, Memorial music, anyway, I've enjoyed that and I've really had a good time with it. And I hope you've enjoyed it too. But now, the beginning and the endings of the tapes, I have some really nice stuff. I can start using Richard Neal's stuff. We have some stuff from the Florida contest that Jimmy uh, brought up from the, he went down to the contest. There's some really good collection of stuff going into the library, so it's not going to be just Wendy standing at the bench like a slave sanding or whatever. A nice variety of stuff from all over the country, and we're still hoping we get Derek Picard to send us the world's tapes. Have not gotten them yet, though. Anyway, I'll finish sanding this out, and then we're going to do the glassing on camera. Now, after all the sanding is done, before you actually glass it, one final time, sight down it. Make sure you haven't sanded off the center line. Because once you glass this, this is, this is going to be permanent. You're not going to be able to get any dihedral or anhedral out. This looks relatively straight. We're pretty much ready to mark this up for the glass work. Okay, the resin that we're going to be using, an all glass work, all glassing of balsa wood. This is the material I use. Remember, it's always the SIG epoxy where one tube is twice the size of the other. And of course, you mix twice this amount to this one. We're also going to use half ounce cloth, the stuff that comes from aerospace composites, which is pretty much the same as the SIG cloth. It's not a whole lot different. Now, I do something real simple. If you don't have the foam cores, of course, you can use pieces of the foam core. But you need to have a little, like a bridge here, so that this isn't sitting on a table. So that once you do the glass work, you can flip it over and do the other side. It's important to do both sides at the same time. Not let one side dry. You'll notice if you let it dry, it's going to bow up. You want to get both sides done if you can at the same time. This holds it up. Now, another nice trick is to get, and I think we have a, oh, a flannel shirt, anything. We always have junky flannel shirts. And that kind of holds it in position. And then we'll get another rag for the other side, and that just will hold it in position while we're doing the glass work. And all I'm doing is I'm marking up right on the sheets itself with a razor point pen. Remember that little razor point pen I described on the previous video? Just with little dots. And this will be the, the edge of the last. This will be the, the last. This will be the biggest piece of glass cloth, then I'll make one a little bit smaller, so I'll have two, and then right down the center I'll have what I call a band-aid with just a strip. There'll be three layers of glass on the middle of this. Now it serves more purpose than just to keep the tail from flexing and folding. What it does, it gives you a nice solid pad to mount this into the fuselage, and you know on our fuselage we have 64th plywood where this is going to mount, so it'll be a nice rigid tight assembly, and it should be very light if it's done properly. Now I'm laying the glass cloth out. Notice the grain goes this way. The grain doesn't go side to side, the weave, and front to back. You'll lose 50% of the strength. You want it to go on a complete, like an X pattern. Now what I'll do is I'll take my razor point pen again and just transpose the dots right out onto the glass cloth. I'll have a pattern then. And then I can go home. Go home. Yeah, I can go home. I can go back take the really sharp scissors and try to make a pattern. Then I'll make one for the bottom and of course two that are just a little bit smaller, maybe a half inch smaller, and then two band-aids for the center. And I'll have all my glass cloth cut. All you have to do is lay the cloth right on top of the original. This will be act as a pattern. Take the little razor point pen and just put the dots right on it, end at the trailing edge. And you have the perfect pattern now, transposed out onto the cloth, ready to cut. You can see how that looks. Now what I do is I hold it over some bright colored paper, and I'll just take the real sharp scissors and do my cut, and that should be a perfect, perfect match for that pattern. 
Now I just roughly laid out my second pattern here, the, the middle one I won't need dots for. And I'll lay the glass cloth on here and cut out two pieces for that shape. I have the two cut. You want to have all your glass, all the glass cloth cut and ready to go. Once you mix the resin, you want to get busy and just go right through this. One, two, three. You don't want to be stopping in the middle of it and cutting glass. Have all the patterns cut ahead of time. Now I like to get all the materials ready here before I start this. And actually one of the things that's a nice little trick, a tip, you can tape the little piece of paper, you're going to mix your epoxy onto the table and that won't let it move it around and you can't get a hold of it. You also want to get your trowel, that little trowel clean, get a little brush, get the epoxy and a place to wipe the scraper. Now I mix up the epoxy, hit it with a little bit of heat, that'll make it a little more uh, capillary, watery, whatever you want to call it. When the little epoxy brushes just go out to the end of the dots and you got to kind of work a little bit on the fast side here. Notice that here's the things that are important, that the little stab, now see I work everything so that I can work by myself. If you have friends over at the time you can have them hold these things in place or whatever, it'll be a big help. I have to kind of gear everything around working alone most of the time so I have all my techniques down to where I almost you know can do it by myself. Drop the cloth right in. Now you can see if you just do the little pat with your finger you can move it around a little bit kind of line up the little dots if you can. You got one layer on there it's because it's a little warm a little bit of heat will just soak it right up. Now as you apply the heat you'll notice if you go sight your center line you're going to lose your center line at for a little bit at a time. Get the second piece. This is why you want to have all your glass cut ahead of time. Drop that right in. Pat it down with your fingers. Notice everything is nice and warm and capillary here. It's soaking right up. And our little band-aid piece. The little piece we want to have over the middle. Now if you leave this little band-aid piece out what happens is you tend, because this is a point, you tend to sand this little top off and it'll be the weakest where it needs to be the strongest so I would not suggest leaving off the band-aid. Okay what I do is I just take the scraper work from the middle out just very lightly scrape it get rid of all the epoxy. Always work from the center out to the edges scrape the scraper off if you go from front to back and start at the center work your way out to the edges and you'll notice you can get almost all of the epoxy off. Uh, the idea isn't to make this so paper light that it breaks or why glass it at all. Now you want to warm up the epoxy, the low setting on a hair dryer. You don't want too much heat or you'll melt the foam. The other night I was showing Brian how to do this. I even got him doing good glass work so not difficult to do but it's it's one of the techniques if somebody gives you all the tricks and tips you'll probably be a master uh, within the first couple times you do it. Now I don't want to make this totally dry now what I want to do is get my jar of alcohol good old isopropyl alcohol notice I'm trying to work fast here so I can get a little bit of alcohol just a little bit start at the middle and may pretend it was like a drawing of a sun. Work from the center out. This breaks the edge and you'll have very very little sanding on this. You won't have any big steps to deal with. And of course the trick now is just take this, flip it over and do the other side. Now I have the other side glassed off camera. I didn't want to forget to mention is the side that you're going to cut, you're going to cut one side of this for the horn. Whichever side you decide to cut for the horn, which will be now be the bottom, you'd like to make and put an extra little postage stamp right in front of where the cut ends. And I'll do that on the other side. The other side will be my uh, bottom. You could look at the sheeting and see which side is the nicest or which side sanded out the nicest. Leave that as the top, then the bottom, and, and again this feathering out with the alcohol is just 
just perfect. You'll have so little sanding, it's unbelievable. You also need to uh, wait at least 24 hours, preferably 48 hours, for this to dry. If you do wait the 48 hours, this will sand out like butter. It'll be beautiful. Now, last but not least, we have all the glass work. I put the little postage stamp on there. Check that we haven't lost our center line. And we put this away to dry for 48 hours. Actually, this can dry all day tomorrow while Joe is here. The last step, of course, of this operation. Clean everything up, including anything that's gotten on the table. Isopropyl alcohol. Clean the trowels up. Get a bunch of these from SIG next time you order from SIG. They do wear out. They do get rough on the edge, and when they get rough, you can sand them once or twice, but you can't sand them a lot more than that. They need that paper-thin lip to do nice glass work. And, of course, the little brushes you can clean. Cheap. These little uh, flux brushes or whatever you call them, but always good. Being I'm such a cheapo, I don't like to waste anything. Clean everything with isopropyl, including your hands. And we're ready to go on to the next step. While that's drying, we can work on the elevators, get the hinges set in there, make up the horn, get all that stuff ready to go. Never waste food. People are starving in Poland and Rutherford. Now here's a really good trick at this point in time as I'm laying a piece of tape out right down all my hinge pot. Now see this one is off just a little bit. This one is off just a teeny bit. These are nice and tight, tight, tight. Now what that allows me to do, and this is this is stuff that you really, uh, if you're seeking perfection in craftsmanship, you want to get them all on an even line. So I'll take my sanding block and just even each one up until I'm even with the tape. Of course, flip it over, run the tape on the other side. Before we cut the hinge pockets in there, the, the slots, I'm, uh, slots. Before I cut the slots, I want to make sure those pockets are perfectly square up and down and all even, so that when I sight down this way, I have them all in a perfect line. And believe me, it's little things like that. Again, I always say this, little things like that that separate concourse winners from uh, second and third row planes. Just that little bit of quality. You just see just a couple of swipes, we'll get them perfect. Instead of being almost perfect, they'll be perfect. Little tricks, little tips. Okay, you take the tape off, and I have that side. I'll just reverse it and do it the three extra times. Have all of these in a, this, this edge will be in a perfect line when I'm finished. Good trick, good tip. Now one of the next things I want to do, you see I've done it on one side already, is I want to get that center line back into the hinge pockets. Without having that in the hinge pocket, and I want to make sure it's true right up and down the center. Well, to do that, one of the things that's almost impossible to do is hold this up on edge and draw a center line. Yeah, it's almost impossible. So one of the things I've improvised here, and I can pass this along, is two pillows. Lay that right in between two pillows. Now you can kind of grab it with the ruler. Put the ruler on one side. If you have shaky hands, tape the ruler on one side and then fine tune the other edge and then get your center line right down the middle. Believe me, this is a good trick. This is one of those tricks I, uh, I really hope everybody can take advantage of because getting the center line in that hinge pocket and getting them all lined up is a very difficult thing to do. And learning some of the little ways of doing things, and I hope other people, if they have some good ideas, I hope they'll send them in and we'll pass them on, get them on the video for future generations, future people that are going to be trying to pick this hobby up. It's hard enough to pick it up when somebody shows you, let alone when People are busy keeping secrets from you, or even worse, leading you down blind alleys with nonsense that no way can it work. Okay, we got all of the center lines on here now. Now having that held right between two pillows is a good trick. 
Here's another little another little trick. I never trust anything, even rulers. I like to be able to sight things. And I want to line up and see that I have that line. It goes through all the high points of the hinge line and through where the hinges are going to be. And believe me, this is real important. Otherwise, what you wind up with is the elevator higher than a stab. You wind up with bows, kinds of crazy stuff. This is a thing that takes quite a bit of time, and it's worth every bit of effort. Now, one of the things I just noticed, I have one of these in a little crooked. When you get one in a little crooked and it's off to the top, put the additional line to the bottom. And now you can set, when we go to set the, uh, the hinge gap or whatever you want to call it, the, the pocket, we can set it right in the center of that. Let me show that up on a close-up. Now see this one out here, I have the line up a little bit too high, so I've put the line a little low. And I'll set, when I, when I uh, cut that out, I'll cut right in the middle. When I see two lines, I'll cut right in the middle. Otherwise, I'll cut right on the line. Now, what I like to do when I put the hinge slots in, I've tried all those pickers and slotters and slivers and all kind of nonsense, but this is the best way I know. A parting wheel. Try to get the parting wheel. You notice it's just about the same size as an IM hinge, so you're pretty close. But you don't want to run it in so far as to touch the bolt or else you get a little notch in it. You want to just go in real slow, real steady, practice on some scrap wood so you can just cut a nice little slot and back it right out. Hold each thing steady on the table and I'll show you my little technique for doing that. It works well and you get some really nice hinge pockets. Now the way we're doing this, you can only cut the hinge slots in the elevators now. When we're all done with, this, with the elevators and the horn is in, then we'll marry this up to the stab and we'll transpose this into the back of the stab. If you try to cut the stab in the elevator at the same time and then you go put the hinge in, it does that, it does this, the tips don't line up. I prefer this way, only put it in one side first. And this is, this is the best way I know of to do it. Try to, try to hold the Dremel tool steady on the table if you can. Don't go in all the way up to the shaft. Try to keep it 90 degrees to the table. Notice I have the pad on the table. So make for some real nice hinge pockets. Now one of the things you can do if you're in doubt, I don't have any <coughs> sitting right here. Oh yes, I do. Got a couple of them. I got these little miracle hinges or whatever they're supposed to be. And what I like to do is stick one in everywhere there's a hinge. I should have more of these. Not organized today. And what you do is, you can even take pieces of 64th plywood, it won't matter. You can sight down, you see I can sight down, and they're, they're perfect. If you have one out, one in, one out, one in, and then the hinge is going one up, one down, you never get those, those greasy, smooth controls. And you look at any of those planes, the controls are absolutely perfect. That's the one thing all those planes have, is perfect controls. Now I hope with all those tips, you know, and all that emphasis I had on nice controls, you'll get really perfect little hinge pockets. This is from the Griffin. Perfect. And all of the hinges lined up as if they were one piano hinge, all in one. Now the next thing I'm doing, I'm taking a piece of 30-second plywood, and I traced out the edge of the elevator on it with the grain going front to back. And I'm going to cap off the edge of this elevator with that. Okay, now on that piece of plywood, I'm going to glue a piece of aluminum tube that the horn is going to go in. Just going to clip off a piece of aluminum tube with an eighth inch ID. It's the one size bigger than fuel tank tubing. And that'll be our tubing that we can slide the horn in and out of. Now 
all you have to do is just roll this along the, the table and cut the tubing. And what I like to do is countersink it on both sides too. It just makes we're going to be taking these elevators on and off throughout the whole life of the plane until we actually glue them on permanently. I also want to take some whatever kind of sandpaper, roughen up the tubing. It just gives it a better, the glue a better grip. This is this is a part of the plane that, you know, really you don't want no any compromises here. You don't want five years down the road for this to loosen up, horns to get loose, horns to bend, horns to break. Anything to do with the control system, no compromises. Now I'm trying to locate the pivot point for the ball link. This is going to be a new way we're doing this for the first time. Three eighths back, that should be easy to plot. And 150 to 187 thousandths down, and that's going to be our pivot point. And these are all specifications that Big Jim has given me for this year. So what we want to do is go over here and transpose that number right onto that piece of plywood. Now with a mic I'm plotting out 187 thousandths. I'm going to put a pinhole right here and then go draw a hole for that ball link linkage. All right, I've got that hole drilled on center for 187 thousandths. And this is what I'm going to be using. Threaded ball link. This is at Big Jim and Mike's suggestion. This is what he used and it worked real well. This is the first time we're doing this, so we're going to have to plot our way through this. Now, one of the things I want to do is I want to put a little backup extra piece of plywood on here so this is a little thicker than normal. Um, just to give the nut and the washer a little extra support here. Now I just fix CA, install that tube on there. Now I'm going to butt join some eighth inch wood on here, a little bit thicker than eighth inch actually, the thickness of the tubing, so that I can have some support for this. Now it looks like what it needs is two pieces of sixteenth and a piece of thirty uh, second, and I'll just laminate this up. I'm doing it in laminations, but the grain is all going against the horn. None of this grain is going front to back. Now as you make up these laminations, of course, you notch it out. Let's see if we can do this on camera. Notch it out so that the tube sits in end grain wood. Now after all the lamination is done, just block sand this flat with the tubing. And rough out, <coughs> rough out another piece of 30-second plywood. That'll go on this side, and we can run the ball link right through, and we'll be in two pieces of plywood at the same time. Now, an easy way to do this, and once one is just glue this piece right to the other piece. You need a little relief in the front for the horn on the other piece, but we could take that out with the Dremel tool. Glue them together and saw it out with a brand new jigsaw blade. You've got the whole sandwich made in one stroke of a pen, and we'll be ready to put the ball link on. I put some thin CA on the threads, just ran it right in. It's actually sticking through the back of the plywood. I ground it off. Now it just make sure that's in there good and solid. Now, of course, I'll take some five-minute epoxy and get this glued right to the edge of the elevator. Now, while this one is drying, I can be making up the other side, and then I can sand these in. This is another one of those jobs that's a pain in the neck to hold this while you're uh, trying to get this in. What I did, I shoved it in between two pillows, made a little sandwich, and you can see this gives you a little bit of leverage you can get this you'd like to get it squeezed down as hard as possible and on center of course now we'll make the other one up off camera for the other side of course it won't have the ray brutal linkage pretty much identical while we're making that this one will be drying it is sanded all in real nice now one of the tricks i use here is when I'm done sanding this all and you can see I've just taken some thin CA run right over the, the whole edge end grain 
and then out onto the sheeting maybe a quarter of an inch I think you can see it on the macro lens don't kick it just wipe it with a paper towel now what that does it hardens up the wood you get that little bit of hardness in the end of the wood here and it'll let you block sand that right in real nice and neat also adds a little strength here and of course we'll double tissue this when we go to tissue it We've got the ball link mounted we have our little uh, slot for the eighth inch horn and now while this this one is done now now what's good is we can go up take the other one the other one should be dry by now so while we're always working on something while one is dry and one is being made all right this is all we got done today this we're gonna let that dry now before we sand it out we're gonna see Joe tomorrow and Maybe to, maybe tonight after supper we'll make up the horn. Who knows? Get some time. We got the ray brother linkage in. All this kind of block sanded out roughly, and we hope we're going to have a good visit with Joe tomorrow. Joe Adamusco finally arrives from a, <laughs> an AA meeting. Look at what he brings me. Spitfires. Oh my God! Now who did this come from? Uh, Roger Lads in Boston, Lincolnshire, England. England, yeah, he's written to me too. Nice and guy. He had some questions on uh, my Bucks Deluxe and the elliptical wing. So I wrote him back, sent him a bunch of information, and I asked him to uh, send me uh, something of stunt interest from uh, the UK. Yeah. So he wrote back and said they, uh, they really didn't have anything of uh, control line stunt interest, but he knew I liked Spitfire, so he sent me a lot of information on Spitfires. Yeah, let's some look at photos, some of this stuff. Oh my posters. God. Let me go through these real quick with the. Now, one of the things I want to mention is Joe has worked up that pattern master wing into an elliptical wing. So, of course, uh, this is the guy he wrote to me about the stalkers, too. Uh. We had thought, what a cool thing going to England, the world championship team. Be neat if they had Spitfires. And that's the wing Joe's basically been working on, the Spitfire elliptical uh, configuration of a pattern master. Really nice paint. Nice photos. I wonder if this guy gets all these photos. He Did he take these? He took know? those. He lives not, uh, he said, 13 miles from this British uh, memorial field that they keep the... Uh, Battle yeah. of Britain flight center down. Yeah, the Pattern Master Spitfire. Soon to come. Maybe next year. Next year. Oh, look at this with the SST. That's cool. Anyway, and this big poster. Look at this. Is this outrageous? Get some of this off here. Look at this. Griffin engines. Merlins. Griffins. Oh, my God. Beautiful. And now look what Joe did. I'll let him tell it on TV. Okay. He took my Pattern Master. Like my cardinal this is plan. The, the cardinal <laughs> plan. And uh, in one of my magazines or books, I noticed that the British had a sea fire. And I looked at this and I said that, that even that paint job would probably look nice as a uh, control line stunt ship. Yeah. Nice rudder. Yeah. Picture that with a wiggly rudder, bubble canopy. It has that Griffin counter rotating props. Yeah. So what I did was I took that profile and I kind of laid it over the cardinal plan form. And uh, this is great. I steal a design from Greenaway, and he steals it from me. And oh. it looks like it'll fit right in. The side area is right about in. the same. The only Boy, the only exception perfect. would be that there's a. Let me get something like it. Yeah, it's per. It's damn near perfect. But you lose a little bit of area back here on the dorsal fin, but uh, you can make up with that here, and maybe losing a few square inches. Everything can all be enlarged, but it, it stays in line. And the gear coming out of the can be a nice setup, a nice rounded off kind of a front on a cowling, a, working maybe even with a two and a quarter inch diameter spinner or something to get a little more of a rounded front end. No, I can't wait till Greenaway sees this idea. But uh, even with the, the paint job, nice, who knows, white, yeah, yeah. black top block. Bubble By the way, as we're doing this, we're watching Richard Neal's video in the background. He sent me some video of the Confederate Air Force here. Nice video, of course. Thanks, Rich. But uh, we really were, were overwhelmed with semi-scale stuff today as we get in right in the right time of the year to be doing this stuff, too.
need some inspiration before you can build anything. You just can't build a, you know, you know, just sit down at the table and build an ironing board or something. You need some inspiration. I really do like Spitfires. Having the World Championships in England, as they will next cycle, this would really be the subject of choice for uh, a World Championship team. Look at this. Look at the color. Yeah, White, I know. Black, They're outrageous. Yellow, blue, red. We didn't even show this. Indian. You've got this up here too. What's? Yeah, this is the um, the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight brochure, and basically what it does, it explains the uh, the program for 1994 and how they have various uh, authentic aircraft from that Battle of Britain era. Yeah, they yeah. They have five Spitfires, one Hawker Hurricane, and one. Lancaster bomber. Yeah, look at this. One of almost every kind. Yeah. And what they do, they fly this chipmunk, the pilots that fly in this uh, uh, memorial air show, which they put on, you know, several times a year, just like the uh, Blue Angels put on there. Yeah. To keep current with tail dragger aircraft, they practice in that chipmunk so that they yeah, won't make yeah. any mistakes. Outrageous. And one of the. Uh, one of the Spitfires in this uh, air show is actually one that flew in the Battle of Britain. So it's well over 50 years old. Yeah, cool. And a lot of other interesting... Neat stuff. Neat stuff. Stuff. And then what? Well, I'll tell you. That's a that fit or what? Integrity of the rudders. Better copies of that. Boys. Boys. I don't know. All right, now this is, a, Joe wants to do a little demo on doing elliptical flaps, and he made up some fixtures here. Let's take a look. Okay, these are what I use to make the flaps and elevator and wingtip pieces for my stuntress elliptical wing. And my plan is to utilize the same idea on my, uh, my PM elliptical wing whenever that airplane gets built. But the problem would be one of, uh, you know, getting an elliptical or a curve shaped flap to have the same taper throughout where you have it nice and even. There wouldn't be any twist warps and something that would look good. Obviously, you can sand and look at it and try to do the best you can by hand. But I always had this idea that working with jigs or fixtures or anything to make it uh, set up so that you could mechanically go through something and make identical parts. So basically what I did, I took a piece of pine wood. This looks to be like a half inch or five eighths inch thick. And uh, I used a saw and a sander to get my curve to my plant form, my flap. And then I used a piece of thin sheet metal to uh, set up the thickness of the leading edge of my my flap by having it tacked in with small brads on one side of the my jig board and then on the opposite side uh, if I wanted to have let's say an eighth of an inch thickness at the trailing edge I just took that same piece of sheet metal set it up so that it would be an eighth of an inch uh, above the the board my jig board and use some brads to nail that down and I cut my my bare flat blank put it into position basically working with quarter inch I had the leading edge of the flap position against the quarter inch thick section and before I put the blank in I pre-sanded one side so that it was perfectly sanded as smooth as I'd want to have it because I'm only going to shape one you're side. You're only going to shape one, one side, side when you do it this way. Okay. Yeah. Which, Midgley pay attention I want pattern master jigs. So I would put the blank in and then once it's in you take a sanding block and you kind of sand across. You can start out with coarse uh, uh, grit paper like maybe a, a 60 grit or 80 grit something like that and you sand to get some of the most of the stock off the trailing edge and you follow it up by uh, you know 100 grit paper on a block and you get it sanded so that you have a, an exact shape here exact taper and you could use the the, the sheet metal edges which are going to scuff up your uh, let me see if you got a sanding block here 
that this would be how it would work. You'd have your blank in there and you'd sand until you get until you hear the metal coming through. Until you hear the metal, then you know you're then you know you're good enough. Then you get a lighter block and you get your blank sanded down. Now this would work good for uh, let's say in this case it would be your inboard flap. And what I did to make just to make sure that my tapers were correct, I would remove the sheet metal and place it. You can see where I had it position for the outboard flap on the opposite side. You just reposition your sheet metal strips and I guess you can get away with by making two flaps of the, out of the same jig. But Why couldn't you just take one and flip it over? Well you could but then you'd have the uh, the sanded smooth edge. You might have end up with a few mill marks or something that... Uh, oh from the rough sandpaper, yeah, yeah. You might but if you're careful. Yeah, but I yeah, just, yeah. in order to get my leading edge of uh, the flap pretty even because you're going to end up with a taper but then you you know you kind of angle and taper those off anyhow so that's how I would do the flaps for my elevator I did the same thing except I don't have the sheet metal strips on here and since my stuntress had a geodetic type built up stab I didn't need a, a block to sand anything to but this was how I was able to arrive at nice tapers and then there's always a little bit of touch up work you'd have to do now here's a case where I uh, I had to have a tip former or tip block cut that you know basically was three eighths of an inch that tapered to uh, a sixteen. This one got interesting. I really had to think about what I was doing here. Did you notice I have a little shim, piece of balsa shim in here? Whereas I took the blank and my first, uh, I started out with a piece of three eighths thick sheet. And you wanted to build that taper down, so, so the before, was before I put the balsa shim in there, I put the piece of three eighths in, and then I tapered it to a quarter of an inch. I did two pieces because I had two tips. Mm. Then after I had them tapered to a quarter inch, I put this shim in there, which was an eighth of you know an eighth of an inch piece of balsa. So then I flipped them over, put it in, and again I had to do it in both directions. So you got to take your sheet metal off, put it on the other side. But by shimming it that way, and I kind of had like a floating edge uh, block here to, you know, in case you were off a sixteenth or so. But you can yeah, actually yeah. wedge your workpiece in there. Then by shimming that, I was able to get it up to where I actually had a, a center line. So this piece of tip wood would be. Uh, this is for the stuntress, this the, piece? Yeah, and this would also be what I'd do on my new PM style. You know, I'd have to make a new jig, but the idea yeah, is that... Yeah, yeah, but you can make this out of pine or something. It doesn't cost anything to right. make it. Who cares? And then you'd sand that to shape, and you'd have a piece of wood that was perfectly tapered that you can glue in position, because you don't want to have any warps on these tips. You want to have them straight. Oh, yeah, yeah, for Because sure. this block then would have holes uh, cut in it to lighten it up, and then your sheeting would be uh, glued over that, and, uh, you know, that's how... The mistake I made on my first elliptical wing with uh, too many warps... I thought about it and figured out this way of doing it, but... Boy, it never hurts to have a fixture. That's just sure. uh, an idea how I did it. And... Uh, now, this morning, <clears throat> this glass has been drying for two days. And it really doesn't take a... <clears throat> it doesn't take a whole lot of sanding to get it blended in nice, but the thing you want to look for most of all is not to get the centerpiece sanded down to where, because you're coming to kind of a point in the middle, you don't want to weaken that center joint. So what I'm going to do is get this smooth just a little bit, and I'm going to try to stay off that center joint. I don't want to get that center joint thinned out. Then of course once I get this dressed off a little bit, the next step will be get the horn put in position. What the horn does, the horn establishes the length of the elevators. We can cut the hinge pockets and put the tips on. And maybe in the next day or so, get this ready for finish. A lot of people don't realize how much time it takes to make a stab and elevator. It takes almost as much time to do a nice stab and elevator as a wing. So sometimes you have to just be real patient. And you think, oh my God, this is taking longer than I wanted to, but to get a nice light tail, it definitely takes time. Now what I'll do, I'll finish this off with 320, and then I'll get ready to put the uh, 
Line up the horn, get the slot cut for the back of the horn, and get the horn in position. Now here's just a couple of things that I do to the horn. Of course, I silver solder in the bushing with Stabrite solder. That's That always seems worthwhile doing. Make these little clips out of tin can stock. Just wrap them around and pinch them with pliers and trim them off. That's just going to act as a bearing. And you can see I've taken that. Let's see if we can get this on a macro lens real good. Taking a grindstone and ground away. I want to leave a ball on the end. The ball actually sits in a tube and it gives it the strength it needs. This is just extra weight going along for the ride, but you don't want to get anything cut away from the the rounded part, the bend. The bend is where it needs to be the strongest. As soon as the bend ends, you can see it tapers to a ball and then just stops. This will get a gram or two off the horn. You actually can make one of these horns lighter than uh, if you keep grinding away at it. If you uh, really going crazy to make the world's lightest horn or something, you can sit and grind away. But the big important thing is not to have the horn any wider than necessary. It's the width that adds weight. You don't want to have a six inch wide uh, you know, elevator horn. That's where the weight really is. Keep it as short as possible. It's why all pro stun horns have a flap horn and an elevator horn. That's the whole logic. You don't have it any longer than necessary. This gives it the rigidity. The longer you make the horn, the more rigidity you lose in the control system. And never, for any reason, I don't care what anybody says, use three thirty second horns. This, this is the only thing I ever use. Now the trick here is to get the horn inserted into the trailing edge so that you have the middle of the eighth inch wire right on center here. You don't want to have the horn cocked this way, that way, or sitting too deep in the elevator, or sitting out on the end, or you'll, you'll make a, a very uh, erratic, that would be the best word, uh, hinging. You want to have all the hinge pins and the center of the horn right along in one one complete straight line as if you could shoot a laser light right down there and when you find a plane where the controls are really nice and free that's usually one of the contributing factors so I'm going to notch this out and the idea is not to notch this any more than necessary just enough to get the horn to sit in there a zona saw is the easiest way to do this line it up put some dots on there this is how far out we have to go And all you need to do now, we're going into some a real soft piece of wood here, so I don't want to take any more out than I have to just to get the horn to sit in here. Now, zona saw, just get the notch, and I'd make it on a small side first and then pick away at it until you get exactly the amount you need. I'm going to do it just cleaning up the hole here, the little slot. Put some folded back paper and get a nice radius where that bushing is going to rest in a trailing edge. Again, you don't want to make this slot any longer or any wider than it has to be. Just to get that, in other words, it doesn't have to go any further back and when the controls are in full deflection, when this seals up, this, this slot doesn't have to go any further forward. That's an important point. Keep the tail as rigid as possible and as light as possible. Now the last thing, to get a nice radius in that, that ditch that we've cut in there, I just take the wire itself, kind of press that right into the ditch. Gives you just the right shape into the soft wood. Now, but just before I glue this in permanently, before I put that in, I want to put a couple drops of chain lube on that bushing so that bushing won't have a, uh, if, if a drop of CA gets in there or some dope or whatever, it won't stick. So I'll take this out, just put a drop of that PJ1 chain lube in there. Now, if you don't, if you don't have a can of this in your inventory, this is a good, go to any motorcycle supply place, this is spray on chain lube, it goes on like water, it dries up into wheel bearing grease. And it's 
pretty much lasts forever. It has a high capillary action. This is the best stuff I know of for lubricating controls, belt cranks, push rods, whatever, wheels in between maintenance on the plane. A drop or two of that will really save you a lot of work. Now another thing to remember too is you want to have, when you do put the final uh, set on this horn, you want to have the bushings pressing as tight to the upright as possible. This way it keeps, there'll be no slop going side to side. Keep the bushings pressed right up to the upright as tight as possible. And make sure this is perfectly free. If it isn't, just keep working it in and pinching it with pliers until, it, until it's as free as possible. What I've done from time to time is forgotten to put the uh, the lubrication in there and what uh, what can happen is a little drop of CA gets in there later on and oh my god, I think it's all frozen up and you're making yourself crazy trying to get it to work. Now because this stuff is so capillary, it only takes one drop. And what you do, you let it sit for four or five minutes. It penetrates in there, especially around the, where the upright is. Whatever, I'll let this sit for a few minutes. Whatever isn't, it, it doesn't soak in. We just wipe it off with some alcohol and we'll be ready to glue this right in position. Work the bushings in real good. Because it, again, it's that thing of having perfect controls. Perfect controls don't just happen by accident. They happen by attention to all the little details. Hundreds of little places for friction and every one of them nice and free. This is getting nice and free now. We'll just get the extra off. Give this five minutes before we clean it with alcohol and we'll be ready to glue this in permanently. This is real important. I have absolutely no friction anywhere in that controls. More planes are ruined by having stiff controls. The last thing I do is make sure I have a nice tight fit down that the horn goes far enough in. And what I'll try to show this on the macro lens. One of the things you need to have is this little piece needs to have a little cutout so that the horn can slide far enough in. I may have to go and Dremel tool that out a little more. I don't have enough clearance on that myself here. Now the reason, the reasoning behind this is if you make your own horns and this bend is too sharp, if you make this bend too sharp, it'll probably fracture the metal right here. It's very important to have a nice smooth radius right here and not too sharp of a bend. Very important. All right, there's all the final clearance in the horn. Took some bent up sandpaper and got the groove nice and smooth. We're ready to insert the horn in here. Tack glue it in place first with a drop or two of thick CA just to get, make sure the elevators fit on and everything before you put the permanent glue and put the little braces in here. Now just to mention one of the things you probably don't want to do, and I've done this before, is I've been in a rush to get this done. Put the horn in here, hit it with thin CA. The thin CA went down into the foam and ate up a lot of the foam in this area. So one of two things here, either use thick CA or epoxy. In this case, I'll just use a few drop of thick, drops of thick CA. I don't want this going down all over the place. This is just any way to tack it in position more than anything else. The thin CA is too capillary. It'll just run inside and make a mess on you. Now, of course, make sure it's parallel to the, the center line. Let that just kick off. Give that a minute or so to kick off. Now before we make this permanent, I want to slip the elevators on, make sure a couple of our alignments are totally correct, because if they aren't, I can correct them right now. I want to make sure, number one, that I don't have the elevators doing this, pitched back or pitched forward, and that they line up with the center line. And if they don't, I can get two pair of pliers and just tweak the horn just a little bit because I don't have the horn permanently in there yet. You can see this looks decent, not great. This one is out just a little bit, which means I'll pull this off. Get all your alignment done right now. It's a lot easier now than later. Let's give that a little bend. 
because we're going to be putting these elevators on and off a thousand times by the time we're actually finished here. All right, that looks a little better. Now with all that zeroed in, the last thing you want to do is hold the elevators up before we put this horn on permanently. Get both of the hinges at the end and sight down and make sure the elevators are in straight alignment. You don't have one a little bit down or a little bit up because it's a lot easier to tweak the horn now than later. Now even if the elevators, and they, they almost never come out exactly perfect for the simple reason the, the tubing in the elevator horn could be just a little bit off, but it's real easy to tweak them this way than it is after you glued them on permanently. Now I know a lot of this stuff seems like it takes so long and you just want to get on with building, but it really pays off in the final analysis. There you go. First time you pull out of a wing over and the plane just sits there flat as a pancake, but you'll be so glad you did all these little alignments. All the center lines, all the alignments, all the tweaking, all pays off at one time. Now what I'm doing very carefully is extending this slot just far enough so that what's going to happen is I can get my full deflection and close up the hinge line where it's nice and sealed at full deflection. And I don't want to go even a, even a couple thousandths further than I have to because this is really a, a high stress area. That closes up the hinge line real nice. In fact, I think I'll leave that. And once all the alignments are in and you have this set, then it's time we'll permanently install the horn. Now this is still just tack glued in here, but we'll permanently install it, put some little braces in here, and then we're pretty much permanently committed to this control system. Now I'm taking a piece of soft quarter inch here and I just want to measure this up to make my little brace just to contain the horn. It'll lock it in. So these are the little blocks. I just roughed this one out. This has the little gap for the horn. Notice which way the grain goes. If the grain goes the other way, they'll be almost useless. We'll glue these in position and then trim off all the extra weight around them. This will be our little, uh, little horn containment blocks. This one I haven't cut the groove in yet, of course. Now it's important if you, you want to get a nice tight fit around the back of the horn, I glued this on with thick CA because I don't want to have any chance the thin CA is going to run in here and grease up, you know, gook up the controls. I'll let that uh, harden up. I'll cut the groove in the other block, get the other block on there, and then I'll trim them all down. What I'll do is get a brand new X-Acto and trim this all down. This is what it looks like before trimming. Just trying to blend this all in nice. When I'm all done, I'll give this a little shot with thin CA just to harden up the wood. Now I want to make sure I got the sandpaper on a rule to get a nice smooth cut to where that joins, where the horn's going to join. And again, every step of the way, check to make sure it's nice and smooth. All right, the next thing we want to do is cut the hinge uh, pockets. Now the reason we couldn't cut the hinge pockets in the back of this Back at a stab, of course, is we didn't know the exact alignment. The horn establishes the alignment before you cut the hinge pockets. Now I can just line everything up, mark where my hinge pockets are going to be. I'll cut them the same way I did with the uh, Dremel tool with a parting wheel. I did a test fit, pressed in all the hinges. What I'm going to do now is cut up the tip pieces and get the tip pieces roughed out.
Now, one of the things I always I always think is important is that the wing, the tips of the wing, have to match the tips of the tail. One of the things I can do, I have a piece of scrap top block here, really, just a piece of scrap. I can find the softest spot in this, find the softest spot, and I'll trace out my wingtip airfoil on here and cut it out with the Dremel saw. Good place to use up. This is a nice soft piece. Okay, I got all the blocks roughed out in this dimension. Now what I want to do is tack glue them all in position and then cut my tip shape in. All right, I'm just going to let that five minute epoxy set up. Then I can pull off the tape and start shaping up the tips. Now what I've done is I've set, and this is really important, I'm working off the center line here of the stab. A lot of people don't bother doing this and it causes trim problems. I measured out on both ends, including the tip block, to get the total span and marked it real accurately. Then with the tip span marked, I put a 90 degree line going up and down the tip. Then I went down and got the angle of the tip block that I want, and again, measured very accurately. Now the reason is, you want to have, from the working off the center of the stab, you want to have both right to the end of the tip exactly even, and you want to have the two elevators and the two stab halves a complete mirror image. This is worth putting this little extra time in to do this. Remember what we're just looking for is an exact, you see I put the 90 degree mark down here and that gives me the total span. The span will be exactly even referencing off of that center line. Exactly even. Then I want to have my two, my angles exactly even. So I've taken this measurement here and the measurement off the other side, make sure they're exactly equal. I got all the extra little tip blocks, get rid of them. In fact, what I can do with these, I can save these for the number two plane since the tail will be exactly the same. I'm just going to put a piece of tape around these and save them for the, the next tail. Now, the first thing I like to do is get the blocks even with the trailing and leading edges. Same thing on, on the elevators. Get the, the first thing that tips all those hinge lines parallel before I carve the block. Then lay this in position and get a center line on it before I carve it. Now what's real handy here is to have the long T block. It really gets you that nice, nice straight edge. So one of the reasons a lot of people spend more time making tips than they should, especially wing tips, is they don't do it in a methodical order. Get these edges first, then get a center line, then do the carving. If you try it any other way, it just takes extra time. Now you see I've got these perfect edges. The big sanding block makes it bigger, makes it easier. The bigger the sanding block, the better it'll be and the quicker you can go through this. Now you can just extend your uh, center lines right out onto the tips. Another alternate way to do this is to take some eighth inch tape and just wrap the tape around the edges. That's a nice way to do it too. And then at the, at the very end take the tape off and do the final radius. And now with the center line on there, of course I'll just repeat it four extra times off camera. Get this all center lined up and then I can start putting in my curve for the tip shape and I might even put a little piece of tape along here just so I, I can really get a nice radius edge without making this you don't want to make this balsa in here real thin you want to do all the carving actually in the block none on the foam but you, you only have a very thin piece of sheeting here after we're done sanding it now when you do the elevators you want to carry that 
pointed line from the front and then you want to get these edges pretty much the same angle. In fact you want to get them exactly the same angle. Big sanding block, very handy to have. Now to get all those shapes sanded in, I'm ready to do the radius in. And obviously then when I'm all finished doing the radius and I'll put the pieces together like this with the hinges in them and do the final contour so I have a really blended, one blends right into the other. Now I hope by seeing how the steps go in making a stab it'll save you some time, obviously some energy too. The horn sets up the hinge pockets, the hinges, everything in place and don't do the tips. Now what I've, what I've seen guys do is carve the elevators in this, put the tips on and then try to make a horn fit. Man, that's ass backward stuff. Get the horn in, do it in the sequence that you see. If nothing else, do it in the sequence you see it, because you know you can build it then in one or two days. It's not going to be a big deal to run through this. When you do extra steps and do them out of sequence, you just make a lot of work for yourself for nothing. Now right, we're going to have to head out to the rock pile. Huh? Come back and maybe I'll get this carving done tonight. I hope I can get this carving done tonight anyway. Now tonight I want to get these carved up. I hope I can get this carved up. By the way, Richard Neal sent in some tape from down his way, a contest down in New Mexico. I'm just trying to check it out here. Anybody wants copies of any of these, these other tapes, give me a buzz or give Richard Neal a buzz. Or send me some blank tapes or whatever. Or send me your firstborn. Who cares? Anyway. I like to get a piece of tape around the wood. Because the wood out here gets very thin as you start to carve it. A brand new number 26 blade is a must up here. Before we start the rounding procedure. And of course we're working off the center line, we're just going to start working, take, take small chunks off at a time. In fact, we'll do most of this with the animation feature just to save some time so this doesn't run into a, a big thing. This shouldn't be more than a half hour, maybe an hour's worth of work carving these tips up. Blue wall gas! Wall gas! Well, thanks to Richard. Gas. Now we're coming up on the end of all this carving individual pieces. What I'd really like to do now is get the, the elevators assembled in and then just do a final, final shaping here. I gotta tell you, I really have enjoyed watching old Lou Walgas flying here in Walgas' uh, 60 powered ship. Back in the days when Lou and I were cool guys, young guys, frivolous guys. What were we anyway? I don't know. Anyway, I put the whole tail together now in one piece, and now I can just do a final sanding, and this will be all I get to do tonight. Getting a little tired here. I can dress these edges off and make sure I have them perfect. And this will pretty much be ready for, uh, well, <coughs> one of the things I wanted to try is I want to try to make a piece of this fillet here, pre-make it. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it or not. I saved the piece that came out of there with that in mind. But uh, again, we'll try that. We haven't done that since the arowana, but we'll see if that's going to be a feasible way of doing this. All right, I guess I'll just off camera dust this all off with 400. And that's it for tonight. No, I just want to look over this. What, the final thing I did, I did it off camera, was I rounded off the stab tips 
and round it off the front of the rudder. Try to get the same general look. You know, I'm always trying for trying to make things match like they belong. They look like they belong anyway. And we'll do all the final radius and on the rudder and on here when we get the plane assembled into one piece. But for now, that's certainly close enough. Okay, that's about. Uh, well, we want to we want to give a try to doing that stab fillet off the plane, a la arowana, but. We'll give that a try tomorrow or the next day, just just to see if we can do it that way and save any time or weight. That'll be the next thing we give this a try on. Now I haven't really done this since I built the arowana. On the arowana, what I did is I took the little piece that we cut off of the elevators here, which of course is a lot lighter than a piece of balsa wood. And I made up the fillet before I actually put the tail in the plane. Now there was two reasons for doing this, and this is uh, something you might want to consider doing. The two reasons are because we have the rave rudder linkage and we have the ball link on here ready. What happens is it gets real difficult once this is in the plane, once we actually have this in the plane, to carve that little piece of fillet on both sides with a piece of balsa wood. At least for me anyway, it seems like it's an incredible job. It takes an awful long time. Well, while we have it out in the open here, it's a lot easier to carve this up. Now what I did, I just tack glued on the leading edge piece, put a little half moon on with the Dremel tool, and you can do this. Uh, I'm only going to put this half on with foam. The other side will be hollow so that there'll be room for the rod to go out, assuming that you use an array brother linkage. Okay, and then this will get attached in. And I'll, and I'll fill this in so that what happens is when I drop this right in the plane, this will help align neutral too. Because what I can do is align this up ahead of time, get it in perfect neutral, put the fillet in in perfect neutral. Then when I drop this into the fuselage top, well, I'm referencing off a seven and a half or seven inch piece of wood instead of a three inch. There's a lot more chance I'll get it on right on the money. So this might, I haven't done it yet, I'm going to try to do this and I'll share with you how I'm doing it. But it might be something on future models I'll want to do all the time. Because we already have this little piece, and it's much lighter than balsa wood, and it also has all the cuts in it. You just need to relieve it for the horn, get a nice smooth fit up here, put the trailing edge on, and you have half the fillet. Then I'm going to take a piece of sheeting on the other side so that the whole bottom will be open. And then I can sand this fillet, tissue it, get it all done before I actually even put it in the plane. If it doesn't work out, hey, I'll share that with you too. There's no no ego trip here. We're just trying this. I haven't done this, let's see, uh, arowana since about the mid-early uh, 80s. So let's see if this works. Now what I needed to do is I wanted to get the grain going front to back on here. And I wanted to build up the thickness a little bit. It just didn't blend in perfectly here. So I'm building this up with an extra piece of 45 thousandths. I'll put another piece on the bottom. You can see I have the grain going front to back. And what that'll allow me to do is when I actually glue this on, I can blend that right in. And that'll allow me a little extra room in the back that I can put a uh, marry it right up with the elevators. I only have to do one side of this. The other side I'll just use a piece of uh, solid wood because the whole bottom is going to be hollow. But anyway, if you can follow this by step by step, this may be a way, no matter what plane, even if you're building, uh, like Joe Ortiz is building up a, uh, you know, a, a, a Ray Mustang or whatever, or Borelli's building a Killer B, who knows. Whatever plane you have, this is one alternate way you can do to fill it. And I, like I said, I haven't done this since the Arowana, so I'm kind of feeling my way through this. But once I get all the pieces together, it's another way you can do it. All right, I have both sides of this glued on now. It's just to build up a little thickness now. Maybe you will or won't have to add some thickness depending, you know, I guess on the individual model. But now what I'm doing, and I was trying to show this, as soon as you get this off, get the edges nice and straight. The dust will help kick off the CA. I'm just going to take a little piece of scrap and fill in the little gap in the back, and that'll take care of that piece. And I got the piece relieved for the horn, of course. It's moving, actually, it's going faster than I thought it would.
Now the next step is I want to trim this off even with the other and I want to get this taper exactly and I can just eyeball this, just get some of this. It's a little too thick in the back but it's okay up here. Get a little bit of this done by hand with a block. Now I just want to trim this off roughly even. I'll do the rest with a block, get this piece off and I have just get trying to get this final taper in here to match. And what you have to do is just block sand a little bit and then go up and look and see that you have a nice fit. I know I have to take almost all the material off the bottom and almost none up here. Work off a glass table. Work off a sanding block. Now because it's foam I can't use CA but I took a piece of 64th plywood. You notice how I made this nice little edge so it seals out the oil from getting in by the horn. And this is just a rough fit. Now I'll get up there and I'll get this exactly in neutral by filing away at the edge of the plywood. Get this really in neutral and do the final sanding in and get the back edge nice. Now what it does, once this is, if you do it this way, hey, you know, it takes, it takes maybe a half hour, an hour to make this piece up. But boy, once you have the plane together, you drop the tail in and you're done. This will just save a lot of time. Actually, this is a lot easier in my book than doing it. Uh, I don't know why I didn't do this many times before. Uh, definitely saving some time here. Now, I just thought it would be worth taking a minute here to explain what I'm trying to accomplish since we haven't done this on the video before. Here's the back of our fuse. Let's just say the fuse is going to end like this. We're going to wind up with something similar to that. Well, here's what happens. When you go to line up a tail, usually you own it, you make this little cut. And what you have is this dimension here is usually about three and a half inches. So with this on center, it's real easy to get a three and a half inch. If you're out by a sixteenth of an inch here in a span of three and a half inches, you've got a tremendous problem. This tail is either going down going up or in some way you've lost the center line. Now what happens is because we're going to have our fillet attached this is all going to be one piece and we'll tape it in position. What happens now is we have a seven inch, roughly seven inch piece. Now if we were off even a sixteenth of an inch it wouldn't really matter that much because we've cut in half the amount of error. So and of course if we get it totally even, even better. Now what adds to this is the fact that we're going to have some slop in the elevators. Now what happens when you have slop in the elevators, you don't want to have the slop all up or the slop all down. You want the slop right in the middle. So when it's inverted, you have this amount of slop. When it's right side up, you have this amount of slop. What this does, this is going to allow us, hopefully, because we'll put the press, in other words, the way we're going to do this, let me, let me explain, up at the flap horn, we're going to have the slop built in at the flap horn. And we're going to have this bushing, a bushing in here, a little piece of fuel tank tubing that'll keep this in neutral. As this is keeping this in neutral, and we've dropped this right down in position, we can get this right on the money so it's dead nuts even. Then what we'll do is take this little bushing out, just be and before we finalize everything, glue the top block on, we'll take this little bushing here out and with, when this is neutral, we'll have half of the amount up and half of the amount down. This is a real critical thing, and this has worked well on every plane I've made. And you can go back and look at the record. All the planes that have, have the neutral set this way and have the slop bushing up at the flap horn. Now, it used to be years ago, people used to put the slop bushing at the back. Eh, not so good. You get flappy elevators and all kind of stuff. I like having it up at the flap horn. Take that bushing out after you get all done here and you're all finished, everything's in neutral before you solder this permanently, take that bushing out and you'll have half up and half down. Now if you decide you don't want any slop in here, leave the extra bushing in and you'll wind up with a horn that has an eighth inch bushing and inside of that you'll have a piece of fuel tank tubing and inside of fuel tank tubing you'll have the wire coming out. So you'll have a double bushing, there's no problem. Another advantage of doing it this way is after you've finished the plane and you say, gee, it's got too much slop, because as you add slop, you reduce the total elevator travel. 
slop reduces the elevated travel to a certain amount. You, you lose a few degrees of elevated travel every time you put in slop. So keep in mind, this is all stuff that Big Jim has worked out with Mike and with me and with other people that have gone and done this before. What we're really looking for is the amount of slop that we've come to accept as a traditional amount. And that's a 332nd rod in an eighth inch hole bushing at the flap horn and what we'd like to have then is have it completely neutral the same amount up the same amount down and the tail set in completely neutral and if you get this whole concept in your mind this is the heart and soul of getting a plane to fly level and you notice some planes you watch them fly inverted and it's they can't hold neutral to save their life well, and some planes pull out of the wing over and bang, and they lock right in. Well, this is the heart and soul of what's happening. You're not going to really read about this in stunt news or flying models. There's not a lot of people actually in the whole world that really have a full understanding of this unless you've built 30, 40, 50 airplanes and tried various combinations of this. Now, I was talking to Paul Walker at the Nats this year, and I grabbed his plane. I wanted to see how much slop. He says he has less slop than I do, but when I grabbed his plane, he seemed like he had about the same amount I did. So he may have already figured this out. I know, I know other people, Bob Gildini has even written about this, other people that really know their stuff have come up to this exact conclusion. So save yourself all the aggravation, save making the hatches in the planes, and save having the tail in a little crooked. This, is, this way that we're showing right now is a good way to set neutral real well on the first shot. Now one final point, a lot of people have trouble figuring out how to hold the elevators in neutral. Let's just exaggerate this. And maybe because you don't have good eyes like I do, you want a, a method that's better than just eyeballing it. Okay, well here's, here's a really good way of when we actually come to install on this, we'll tape these into neutral. A good way of figuring out where neutral is, you're going to have a center line, hopefully, on this whole, this whole deal. You'll have a center line going around the front and back. If you want to find dead neutral on here, take a tape measure. You know, the kind of tape measure that a woman would use to, uh, you know, fit dresses. Put a pin in the front here. Put a pin. Let's, let's simulate the pin and measure around here put a pin in the back where you think neutral is and now measure between the pins when this distance is exactly the same as this distance this also works by the way if you ever wanted to uh, neutralize flaps when those two pins are equal and you'll find it even even a sixty-fourth of an inch up or down you know usually a dressmaker's thing won't stretch too much don't put a lot of tension on it you can even do it with a string. If you take a piece of string, tie a knot around here or just loop it around. Now take that string and go up here, mark it with a dot of ink, bring it around this way, wrap it around. Now you've got, when the, when the dots line up, you know you've got neutral. Now what I do is I take, once you know you have neutral, take some masking tape, put some on the top, masking tape on the bottom. Put a little bit of tension. Now if it goes out of neutral this way, you know you can put an extra piece of tape this way. If it goes out of neutral that way, you can put an extra piece of tape. Just like when we put the glass on the wing. By, by putting some tension on that, you can stretch it in the direction you have to. You, you keep these pins neutral. You will have exactly neutral. You drop that down into the fuse side so that pretty much the two pins are going to line up with the top of the fuse side or whatever you've determined if you're using a higher tail, a lower tail, you've got a center line on here. When you could line those pins up with the center line, you're going to have a perfect neutral. And this is worth thinking about and worth doing. Because you go look at planes flying on a field and some of them they just fly inverted, they fly to squares, dead flat. 90% of it is in lining up that tail and at the same time getting the right amount of slop. It's not just a simple matter of building a tight control system with no binds in it. It also needs the right amount of slop in the elevators to fly right. Now I got this hopefully taped in neutral, checked it, put an extra piece of tape on so it doesn't move. 
Now I want to get the final fit on my piece because needless to say I want to have this in neutral when that's in neutral. I want a perfect neutral here. And I'll let this go in with uh, slow dry and epoxy so I can adjust it with a piece of tape little by little as it dries. And I just have to adjust this very little at a time until I get exactly the, the setting that I want. That is one of those deals where you just have to keep fitting it, block sand it off. You can adjust the neutral and swipes of the, actually a couple swipes of the sandpaper and you can adjust the neutral. Okay, this half is tack glued in here. Notice I tried to keep this at least two IBM cards thick. So we have a little bit of, uh, you know, room for paint in there before the controls get clogged up. Now I'll block sand this right in, get all the final fits in here on this one side, then I'll make up the other side with a piece of uh, sheeting or block. And by doing it this way you can really get a super nice fit. Get it block sanded right in, right around the glass area. Now I just put a piece of eighth inch on this side so far now you can see the reason for it being is you have a little trough you can run your ray rudder linkage through here which makes it real convenient you can snap it on and off and whatever during the construction part of this anyway just now what I'm going to do is I'm going to final sand I'll take the elevators off and final sand this in final sand this in get it all nice and smooth make sure everything lines up when I'm looking down the elevators in neutral at the the uh, all that stuff is dead nuts and neutral and that probably now when I tissue the plane I'll bring the tissue right out over here the tissue will firm that joint up same thing on the bottom now the only thing I still have to do I haven't done it yet from this view see I can see let's let's get in on a macro lens I want to make up a little block in here so when the plane is sitting on its feet you can't see that little hole in there so what I'll do is I'll bring the ray rudder linkage up all the way and see just how close I can make that block to fill that in. Also, it'll add a little strength. But this has proven to be uh, at least a reasonably nice way of doing things. Now you can see I put that little dot down there on the block. That tells me where the rave rudder linkage is going to end up. So from that point up I can make my little triangle shaped block. And then I can sand in the fits so that I have a completely even hinge line fit here around the fillets. I made that little block up. Now I'm just putting in just a little bit of CA on the inside of this, just to hold this while I set the uh, hinge line, set this gap. Right, I got that little piece of wood in there. Now I'm going to just sand these down to where I have the clearance for two pieces of sandpaper in there. I want to get that clearance set right and we're pretty much finished with this piece. Now I'm trying to set this. A machinist ruler is real handy to have. Make sure we have that double the thickness of a piece of 320 sandpaper right in there. That'll allow for the paint build up. And of course make sure it's nice and smooth. And of course I didn't get the other one done yet, but make sure they both match. I got all these sanded in real nice, these joints all real nice. 
Everything's in neutral tonight right now. I can just blend in this trailing edge a little bit with a block, and I have this nice trough here. The other thing, I want to make sure I have full travel in the the horn forward and back. If I have to, I can open that up a little bit. I want full travel till the, the hinge lines seal up nice. And I'll give this a whole final sanding out with 400, and we'll be pretty much... Uh, Hopefully wrap this up pretty soon. Get on to the next step. Now that's about all we're going to have time for today. We'll pick this up tomorrow with some final sanding and get to actually get ready for some of the dope. Put a couple coats of dope on here and harden up the wood. Uh, we'll finish the sanding up tomorrow and hopefully get into the doping and the tissueing and whatever real soon. Now today what I want to do, I want to take some 400 sandpaper, give this a final sanding, get every surface on it nice and smooth, and try to get a couple coats of dope on here. Uh, doesn't look out of the question, we have a couple hours to work this morning. Now at this point, you really want to get all the surfaces, all the edges radius with 400. Radius, Radius edges, everything radius before we put dope on this. Make sure this is all perfectly smooth. No, no uh, sharp edges, no sharp edges here, no sharp edges here. Everything a nice smooth radius with the 400 sandpaper. Now with all the parts final sanded, obviously if you have some little spots you have to fill in. We're pretty lucky on this, we don't have any. Fill in the little spots. Dap is a good idea to use on that. Any place you don't have a reverse curve, dap is fine. You know, I, I wouldn't suggest it for fillets anymore. Now just one word while I'm finishing up this, getting all the edges. I don't recommend anybody use nitrate dope. And this is the reason, if you sand down through the nitrate, Joe Adamusco has just had this problem. You sand down through the nitrate, and some of the nitrate gets on top of the butyrate, you can have all kind of chewing gum problems. So I'm going to basically stick to 100% SIG light coat on this finish, except either for the color or for any of the, uh, the fancy trim stuff that we're going to try to do. At least from this point on, all the basing will be done. Everything light coat, the filler will be light coat, Everything SIG, as much SIG as possible. Now I know that's a little more the work than any of these uh, quick two-step processes, but I think the final result is it comes out lighter, and it certainly does stand the test of time, especially on an open bay airplane. So I'm going to mix up some light coat now. What I'm going to do, I'm going to mix up the light coat roughly 60% thinner, 40% light coat, some flex oil and some fish eye. Make a batch of that and get the first couple coats on here and while this is drying I can work on some of the other little parts of this airplane. Now it may sound like a couple of the things I'm going to say are really overkill but they're not really overkill. Step one is, and boy absolutely step one if you learn nothing else, don't use old dope. I have all kinds of jars and cans of dope that's a year old over here, old filler, old everything. Forget it. New stuff, brand new nice jar, I'll put a label on it, what year it is, what day I mixed it, and what it's for. This is the base coat. The first coat of dope you want to get on there, you want to have a little more than average thinner in there so it bites into the wood. You don't want to put the first coat on 50-50. It's not going to get a good enough bite into the wood. If you put too much thinner, if you put, let's make a crazy number up, 90% thinner. Well, what's going to happen, you run the risk that any thin spots on this, it'll go down and melt the foam. So you don't want that either. A good number to start with is 60 thinner, 3608S, and roughly 40% dope. Now, you can measure that out. In this case, I have measurements right on the side of the jar. I'll just fill the jar accordingly. If you don't have, one of the things you can do is just get yourself a little mixer, these little uh, mixers that the medical profession uses, so you can do it a little more accurate. I would say anywhere from 60% thinner to 70% for the first coat of dope, and from that point on you can just add a little bit more dope to the mix with each time. I'm also going to put a label on here, what year did I mix it, what's in here. 
Now you can see I write all the information I need on here. The thinner, how much, what it's for, base coats for brushing, for raw wood. Write whatever you have to so you can identify this. And boy, I can't think of anything in the world that's dumber to do than to try to use up last year's paint. You always run the risk, not all the time, but you always run the risk that maybe it's going to turn into chewing gum. And boy, that can just ruin your whole day. Now after you mix all this up, put all the ingredients in a jar, I mean this goes without saying, shake it up real good. You'll notice it's kind of watery and thin. That's the way you want it. You want that first coat to get right in there. Now also I'm going to get like a half inch or a three quarter inch brush on raw wood before you do anything. Sand, and this is important too. Sand everything as smooth as possible. If you have rough stuff, you're going, to want, you're going to wind up paying later on. Get this all smooth with 400 sandpaper. Get at least three coats, because this is thin. Normally you would put two or three. Three coats thin. If it doesn't look like it's got a little bit of a shine to it, put the fourth coat on. Building up the base coat is not where you're going to pick up a lot of weight. You're going to pick up the weight in the color and, and in the silver. If it's all lumpy, you're going to lose. Right now, get everything flat wood with a nice base coat of clear on it. Speaking of the arowana, there's the arowana. That one had the uh, the tail fillet. See the tail? Well, you can't see it in the picture. That had the tail fillet that, uh, just like I described on this video. There's a couple little spots here I had to touch up with some dap and I just want to get them. I'll work on the elevators first. Always with a block, and always from this point on with 400. Nothing but 400. Get the wood joints real nice. Anything from a three-quarter inch brush to a half inch brush is fine as far as I'm concerned. Just get the first couple coats on thin. If you remember that, the rest will all make sense. From this point on, you could add a little bit of dope to the mixture but don't add any thinner and you can build it up because the dope will stick to other dope a lot easier than it will to raw wood just brush on a nice coat here and hey we can get on with this starting to feel like uh, even though I've been doing all that work on the back room of the house that back room of the house has been making me crazy I got some of the tiles in yesterday maybe before the video is over I'll share 30 seconds of my house project with you you notice as you, as you put the thin dope on the wood, you can notice the wood swell up a little bit. Well, that's good. You're getting a nice wet coat in there. Nice wet coat with no uh, brush marks at all. Now, I wouldn't want to forget some of the things that are really important. Some people think you put one coat of dope on and you put it aside to dry overnight or something. Well, when you're putting a base coat on, the base coat, up to the tissue, you'd like to get it all on in like in the course of maybe two or three hours. Because one coat then chemically bonds with the coat underneath it. Remember what we're trying to do here in a substrate is pick up and get a bond to this raw wood. I'm trying to get a little bit of extra and this is going to take four coats. I'll get four coats on maybe in the course of two hours here take a little break for lunch later or whatever but get them on don't fool around when one is dry get the second one right on dry to the touch because you get a better chemical bond than if you let it dry overnight and nothing is really more frustrating than and everybody knows what it feels like you pull up the masking tape bingo and the paint comes up it delaminates either between the layers of paint or right off the wood when paint delaminates, it almost always delaminates because you don't have enough thinner in a paint or because you put the paint on and let it dry, uh, you know, a year in between or something. You don't get a chemical bond. I'd like to get this all on, if I possibly can, in the course of two hours. Maybe take a little break in between, make some other parts up, or well, whatever. But basically, I would not want to get the base coats on, well, you know, a coat and then uh, the next day get the next coat on. Try to get them on one, two, three, boom, 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 boom. 
all that chemical bonding as one is gassing off you get the next one on one is gassing off get the next one on now the opposite is true when you go to sand this we'd like to put this away for as long as possible before we sand it if we could put it away for two or three days it'll be easier to sand than if we put it away for uh, you know 24 hours or whatever but I've gone so far as even to get the tissue right on all in the first sitting and that doesn't seem to have any negative impact get one coat on an hour later half an hour later another coat on even if you feel like it while everything is sticky and gooey here you could even get the tissue on the problem with putting the tissue on is then you're gonna to have to sand unless it's perfectly smooth and this really is perfectly smooth here we might even be able to get the tissue on here today perfectly smooth woodwork you can go right through this you know like poop through a goose you can go right through it but you can't do that if you have to go back and resand and resand and resand also all the edges an extra coat hinge lines an extra coat any place where it's going to be hidden from view you're not going to be able to get in there later on get an extra coat on hey one other thing I wanted to mention on a video here I just want to and boy this is really cool I stayed up and watched that George Foreman fight you know George Foreman is almost my age and he beat the hell out of some young guy that was the champion I don't really follow boxing but as a memento to George Foreman I cut the picture out of today's paper and I put it up on my wall along with other things to remind me that you're never too old to do this hobby you know you might be too old for boxing you might be too old to play football and eventually you get too old to uh, you know do a lot of sports and activities but you basically can fly stunt forever it's a forever hobby you don't wind up abusing your body like you do in motorcycle racing or whatever or get assassinated like you do if you get into politics so just a little little uh, congratulations to George Foreman world boxing champion Now I'm getting the last coat on now, and I'm going to put this aside to dry. I really won't have the time right now to do the tissue. I'll have to let that go for either tomorrow or the next day whenever we get to work on this again. We pretty much have this all, and I'm putting on a fourth coat here. We have uh, four very thin coats, and this is the important part, is to get this, get this substrate good and solid. Otherwise, nothing is really more aggravating. Pulling that tape up. Boy, that just used to aggravate the hell out of me. And I know how many people have done it before. Even Paul Walker's done it. It's not like you have to be an expert or a, you know, advanced level flyer to have that happen. It's a problem. So I'll get the last coat on this. We'll put this aside to dry. Pick this up with our uh, building tomorrow. What the next time we can get a hold of this. I don't know when we're going to be able to get some time in here. Still need to do some work out in the back finish that tile work up, the grout, all that nonsense. But the thinner it is, remember, the thinner it is, the more coats you're going to need. And this is one spot on the job. There's one, I'll say this over and over again, one spot on a job where you don't want to cheat yourself. You don't want to put not enough dope under the tissue. If that tissue doesn't stick down, forget it. All right, that's all we're going to get to tonight. See you the next time we get a chance to work on this puppy. Now I got a little bit of time this afternoon. I want to try to get this silk span. What I've done is off camera I've taken some 400 sandpaper and just dusted this off a little bit. Medium silk span, medium silk span, not double O, medium. Now if you choose to go with double zero, which I've done in the past, I think you really fool yourself into thinking you're going to have a light finish. You really don't wind up with the quality. What I like is a good base coat and medium, and I get that nice, smooth, solid, the grains of the silk span combined with the paint. I get that real good substrate, and that's what, that's what the medium silk span will give you. GM, I guess, is there. GM. Ford. Medium silk span, ST002. Now on the previous videos we've done a lot of silk span work so I won't belabor this. The method I always use is the Windex method. I like to wet the tissue with Windex. If you can, you can use water as a substitute. 
The Windex doesn't penetrate the wood as much and evaporates twice as fast. I've also heard of people that use windshield washer fluid in a glass bottle. I haven't tried that yet. Buyer beware if you try that. Anyway, you could also silk span dry. In my case, the object of doing it wet is you get a little pressure on it. I press the silk span down. It's wet. I can pull out all the wrinkles. I think you get a lot more stretch in a silk span, especially over foam surfaces. And of course, if you're doing built up surfaces, you have to do it. So, step one, I'll go through. Well, we're almost at the end of the video anyway. I may as well finish this out with the tissue job here. Is just cut out individual pieces the size you need, a little bit oversized. Always have the grain running the same way. If you make one of these up, you know you're going to need four of them. Make four. Grain going the same way. Don't make them up and then do the next one this way. Doesn't matter really which way you do it as long as the grain is the same on all of them. Silk span has a grain. You wouldn't want to make this one this way now just to use up old silk span. Cut up the amount you're going to need. Now another trick, you're doing this, I just happen to have a brand new surgical steel blade here. A good idea is double edge razors with tape on one side. I like this, these surgical steel blades are good, you can keep them in your mouth. Of course, don't hiccup when you have them in your mouth. Okay. Just to get the old silk span laid out wet. I like to pick it up, make sure I don't have it soaked. Now, rather than have it soaked, another good idea is get a paper towel and you can blot it. You can kind of stretch it out, blot it, whatever. You just want it damp. You don't want it wet. Lay some dope out. We'll only do one of these on camera. Lay one side out. Now, when you're putting the tissue down, this is a, this is a good spot to remember. Plenty of dope. Float on a coat of dope, man. You're not looking to save weight down here. This is not, it's going to be part of the substrate no matter what you do. You're only playing with yourself if you put on a watery thin coat. Get a good amount on there. There's a lot of times and places you can save weight. This is not a realistic way to save weight. And down here, down here, you want to get some material on. You want this sucker to stick. You know, if you can see how thick I've got this on here, plenty thick. Otherwise, you run that risk of the tissue pulling up. Into the hinge pockets. We're going to go right over the hinge pockets. And if you can see how thick that is, take the tissue and just go right over it. Now, I just use my bare hands and pat it down, spread it out. Before you do any trimming, you can pull out all the wrinkles. Get another coat right on top of that. You really want to bind this down. You don't want to have a, a spot here where this isn't binding good. Now actually what we're going to do is once we get this the tail tissued out, we're going to put this aside to dry and start the wing. So probably on the next tape we'll start drawing up the plans and get the wing. Good idea now if you understand why we build the way we do and many people choose to build this way something is always drying the finish is always drying this tail can be drying this is the step a lot of people don't do is press it down it squeezes out all the water you can even take paper towel get out all the water and then just put another coat of dope on top you've got the stretch this helps stretch it out You don't have to worry about trimming it. You can trim it after it dries. Get it stretched and get it pressed down most of all. And get a good wet coat on there. And we'll hopefully have put this aside to dry. While we're working on a wing, this will sit away. Well, actually, I don't know how long it's going to take to build a wing, but plenty of time to dry. We don't want a real quick... Uh, you don't want to go at this tomorrow with sandpaper is what I'm saying. The longer you can let it dry, the better. Okay, now all that's left to do, let this sit for a minute or so. We'll trim it off with one of those nice new scaffold blades. Trim up the hinge pockets. Now you can see I just start in here and I 
raise it out off with the scalpel blade and I can press these down with the dope and the brush and then trim everything off nice and neat. It's the same old thing, just push it down with your fingertips, your hands. When you're all done, you can clean your hands with thinners. Pressing it down is part of what gives it a nice bond. Now what I'm going to do is just go through here one by one, get a brand new scalpel blade and get out. Just tear out all the extra pieces. I really like the way the medium tissue gives you a better substrate. What I'm looking for is that nice flat, I can block sand it. If I go through, there's still a little bit of fiber down there left. When you're using double O, as soon as you go through, you need a patch. And I don't think you really save much, if anything, by having it. You also get the tremendous strength of having it. Nothing on the whole plane adds more strength per amount of weight than the tissue. You leave off the tissue on a finish and see what happens. Now I can just scalpel these off nice and easy with the end of the, end of the hinge pockets. And as always, just press it all down. Get all, last step, press every edge down. And one of the things to keep in mind too, as soon as you silk span one side, flip the puppy over and do the other side. Don't silk span one side and then put it away to dry. We're gonna go right, I'll do the rest of this off camera. Get this side tissued, go right through the same procedure, one right after another. Don't do one side and then put it aside to dry, you'll get a bow in it when the dope starts to dry. You want to get it as soon as possible. Always do one side and the other, one right after the other. Now doing a stab, I tried to do this in one piece so I could get, uh, you know, expedite things. The other way would be to, if you didn't have long pieces, would be silk span it here and then overlap the joint so you had double silk span in the middle. I think this will be fine for right now, being we have all this rigidity in the middle. I'm just going to repeat this off camera, what we just did. Stab will be the same. Hopefully we can get this guy put aside to dry soon. Now one of the things I'm going to do is bring the tissue around the, the trailing edge here because we have such a thin piece of wood for the trailing edge. I'll bring the tissue around this way and this piece up here so that the trailing edge will actually have double tissue, which is not a bad idea anyway, even if you have a thick trailing edge. Because that's one of the spots you can't get in and get everything straightened out. If you don't have a good finish in there when you put the flaps on and it's all buffed out and everything, it's really a pain in the neck to get in there. And when I do the bottom, I'll wrap the bottom up and then just trim it. Now you can see what I've done. I also leave a little bit of the tissue over the edge and then wrap that around. So I actually have double tissue on the leading edge. That's where you're going to have all these clumsy guys launching your plane. So it's a good idea. Just wrap it right around, soak the leading edge. We'll have a double trailing edge and double leading edge on this guy. And of course, in my case, because I use that stooge that releases with the, uh, just wrap that right around.
just finishing up this double tissue on a trailing edge here. I'm leaving on the leading edge. I'm leaving just a little bit, just like I did before. Build up a little bit of strength on the leading edge for uh, those lovely people that launch your plane with uh, welder's gloves on and rings and things and, in my case, the stooge. Always a good idea to have the leading edge nice and solid. Okay, I'll just pat everything down nice. Getting that leading edge on double is always a great idea. I love it. Now, from this point on, you might want to put a little bit of extra just a little bit extra light coat in here to thicken it up from this coat on and maybe get on three coats of light coat right now before we go and sand this that'll get the tissue down nice and we could do that off camera that's for sure get this joint real nice wrapped around a trailing edge nice hey it's looking good Oh, yeah, God, junk. I want to thicken this up just a little bit before I put the three coats of base on. And this isn't an exact science here. This is just thicken it up just a little bit to allow you to build it up in three coats instead of five. Right, we're at the end of this tape and believe it or not three coats of uh, dope the thickened up dope are drying up here now we'll give them uh, the longer the better minimum two three days hopefully maybe a week the longer the better believe me the better it'll be uh, we'll pick this up actually while we're letting this dry now we'll start sketching up our wing make up the bell crank the lead outs get parts made make up more parts for the kit and we'll close the video out with some of the uh, either pictures or whatever we can get on the end of this. And hope that you've picked up some good information. Hope you're enjoying the videos. And hope you're sharing the world of stunt with us. This is unbelievable how much fun we're having this winter.